course, and this is Games of the Week. And this time we are going to take a look at Games, the person who is best known as Polish Fighter. You might be asking, who is Polish Fighter? Well, it's the player formerly known as Jan Krzysztof Duda. So let's take a look at his games. So the very first game we're going to take a look at is Duda versus Wojtaszek. And in this game, two Polish players are going to go at it, which is very peculiar because this was always the best two playing. So apart from their intrigue, they're playing for honor as well. So the game starts with e4, e5, and here you can see that they're both playing it solidly, they're not trying to take extra risks. In fact, Wojtaszek is playing the solid lines that his master slash the champion he helped, because he was his second, Vishwanathan Anand second that is, plays the most solid setups. So knight f3, bishop b5, a6. Now of course these days everybody and their grandpa would go knight f6 playing with the good old solid Berlin, but this is a specific enough matchup between these two Polish players. a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castle, bishop e7, d3. Now Wojtaszek is famously prepared, no wonder he is part of the team of Vishwanathan Anand. So Duda specifically does not want to get into a deep theoretical dispute. Now in case of rook e1, b5, bishop b3, castle, you can end up in a heavy theoretical duel in the martial variation, which has been played in the famous world championship match between Kramnik and Leko, and also has been sort of the big topic for the 90s and 2000s. So instead of going for rook e1, Duda decides to go for d3, over defending the e pawn and postponing this idea of moving the rook to e1. In this way, white is winning time, but also eventually white will have to go c3, d4 and exert some pressure on the center. b5, bishop b3, d6. This is a typical slide trick by black, although not an intentional one. Black is trying to consolidate the e5 pawn, but at the same time is threatening to go knight a5. Now, some time ago, when um, Grishuk and Karana tried for the World Championship title or to become a challenger, they came up with this idea of bishop d2, taking away that a5 square, and then try to go on, play a4, and continue that way. But Duda goes with the traditional c3, d3, creating a little bit of a luft, in case of knight a5, there's always a bishop c2. And practice shows that the knight is still kind of displaced over there on a5. And white wants to play d4 anyways, and this bishop will be there to support the e pawn. So castles, a4, undermining the b5 pawn, bishop d7. And chess is getting more and more complex as time goes on. It's not because of the computers, but humans are capable of expecting future troubles. So here, black's main plan is to go knight a5, c5, which is actually called Chigorin style, named after the legendary Russian player. So white decides to circumvent that. Now you can circumvent that in both ways. You can go bishop a2, and if ca in case of knight a5, you can go b4, and just chase the knight away. 
or do what Duda did and go bishop c2. With the same idea, black is just one tempo short. If you go knight a5, white will go b4 and chase the knight away and win time. The other idea is if you go knight a5, white will be able to go and strike in the center and black just does not have enough time to reorganize, which for example would happen in case of rook e1, c5, and the knight is back in time to c6, guarding the e5 square. So rook e8, rook e1, h6. And here it's time for us to find the classical Spanish maneuver. There is this cl classical Spanish maneuver that is very important to note because that's the first thing you've got to know if you want to play this open. So white is always trying to get that d4 move in, but d4 would never really work right now because of either e takes, c takes, and bishop g4, or bishop g4 immediately putting pressure on that knight, pinning the queen, and there is threats of taking and blowing up the center. So white is not quite ready to make the push d3, d4, therefore decides to embark on the regular plan of the Spanish, and that is to maneuver this passive knight on b1 to a much better pasture of the g3 square. Bishop f8, knight f1, d5. And black is threatening to take on e4. Now, for some players, this wouldn't really be a threat. They would just accept the fact that white is not better here and just go about an even position after knight g3 takes and takes. But as his online name shows, Jan Krzysztof Duda is not known for very tedious and pacifistic ways. He is there to have a fighting game. So he takes on d5, which is double-edged, to say the least. Why? Well, white is giving up a center pawn, trades it off, and now it is black who has an extra pawn in the middle, while white has none over there. However, it is compensated by the fact that black has a couple of weaknesses on the queen side and a target in the face of that e5 pawn. So there is ample compensation for Duda, but there is a danger of black overtaking the advantage. Bishop d2, just developing and sort of putting a waiting mode. Duda is awaiting for Wojtaszek's plans, and it's actually not that easy to decide what black should do. Black can keep the position as is, go rook b8 and say if you trade that's fine with me i've got a stronghold on e5 maybe a weakness on b5 but how are you going to get there that would be a solid way of playing but actually Wojtaszek decides to play b4 and be a bit more aggressive sort of locking that bishop to that passive d2 square and here comes another nice little twist by Duda. Duda, even though is considered to be an aggressive player, he does have a good feel for positional chess. And his next move is going to be quite painful for Wojtaszek. So let's try to think about Duda's next move. What could have Duda played here? So we already kind of see that this e-pawn is not really in danger just yet. It's well guarded by the knight and rook. Although if you would try to overprotect it with f6, then you would actually open up the long diagonal for that bishop and that could lead to problems. As 
a couple of grandmasters would agree. Now, there is this classical weakness in these type of position, and that is the a6 and now the xb5 pawn. And now that xb5 pawn moved to b4, it is actually lacking a bit of support, and do not make sure that convoy never arrives. So after e5, I mean a5, that a pawn is fixed, and this b4 pawn is somewhat isolated from the rest of black's forces. So b takes, b takes, knight f6, knight g3, rook b8, bishop a4, pressing on the vk pawn. So yes, directly he's attacking the knight, but the real target here is the e5 pawn. Bishop d6, queen c2, knight a7, wouldn't be minding trades, but Duda, as we said, is not that kind of guy. Bishop b3, aiming for more. Bishop e6. Now, if this was a qualification event, you might be seeing this move raise its ugly head and just pester that rook with a very shocking response of bishop d7. But as I said, that's not going to happen when Jan Krzysztof Duda is playing. He will try his utmost to complicate matters. So he instead decides to take on e6. Rook takes e6. And trading by in itself isn't really making a difference in this position. The big difference comes with the next move by Jan Krzysztof Duda. If he can somewhat unbalance the position, he will get some good winning chances. Now, it is not too hard to find these moves if you recognize that momentary disconnect between black's pieces. That rook is sort of eyeing the nothingness on the b-file. There's actually nothing happening over there. That knight on a7 is temporarily moved away from the center of the action. So it is just high time for Duda to go d4. And with this knight far away, you can't really trade just yet because that would allow rook takes e6, f takes e6, c takes, and then black would get a very compromised structure with this knight on a7 severely out of play. Not to mention queen c4 and queen e6 is on the cards. So d4, knight c6, very good grandmaster move by Wojtaszek immediately bringing in a piece that was out of sorts. Rook d1. E takes d1. Takes. Takes. C takes d4. Queen e8. And notice how black actually managed to reorganize his pieces. It all seemed so jumbled up and didn't look at all too good. However, now black has a firm d5 control compensating for the fact that this e6 pawn is somewhat weakened and as well as the a6 but it's much much harder to get to rook e1 eyeing the target and that weakness rook b5 so it is actually duda's turn to show how he is um, going to make amends of this position because black actually did a splendid job reorganizing. The queen is well placed, guarding the knight and the pawn. The rook is patrolling the fifth rank and pressing this a5 square together with the knight. So it is for Duda right now to try to activate his forces. So let's try to think about that, which one of white's pieces is kind of inactive and not being part of the action at the moment.
So at the moment, the bishop is doing a fine job defending the a pawn. The knight is right there controlling possibly the most important squares in this position, those center squares and the d4 square. The only piece for Duda that is sort of out of play right now is this knight on g3. This knight on g3 isn't doing particularly a lot. You can't really go knight f5 because of this brilliant defense of the b5 rook. So we've got to find a place where it can prove to be useful. In comes knight e4 by Jan Krzysztof. He goes knight e4, hits the d6 bishop, and goes after the f6 knight. Takes, queen takes e4. And this is a great trade for Duda because that knight is not in the way anymore and black actually has lost a defender on the f6 square. Queen d7. And objectively, this position is very much fine for black. Black really does not have to fear the future. Even if white would take on e6, there's plenty of play against those weak a5 and d4 pawn. However, here Duda, the Polish fighter, comes up with a very creative solution. Which is very much vintage, his style. And Duda takes on h6. And bishop takes h6 is that typical move that Karpov and the old guard of world champions would never take. Why? Well, it constitutes a peace sacrifice. Is there like a direct refutation to this move? Not really. Is it bad. Well, it is somewhat dubious. It's not a hundred percent correct. Yet, from a practical standpoint, Duda does get winning chances that he otherwise wouldn't get. And this kind of comes back to one quote I have from Anish Giri, where he sort of compared his play with Magnus Carlsen, and he said that Magnus sort of gets away with um, with some more speculative play that he, that is Anish Giri, is willing to take. And this is something very similar to that. Duda is more than willing to sort of step through that demarcation line saying, I'm here to win this game if it takes a little bit of gambling and taking chances, I'm still going to go that direction. Bishop h6 does exactly that. Now, black absolutely has to capture. Queen g6 check. So black can move two directions. Black can move to h8 or can move to f8. And there is a third one, but it's sort of a non-option. If you go queen g7, there's queen e8 check. And at the end of the day, you lose that knight on c6 and with a weak king on h7 and a pawn weakness on e6 and a6, this is more or less lost for the black player. So here Wojtaszek is faced with a very uncomfortable choice. You know your opponent is bluffing, but you're not certain how. And um, I often notice when people watch these games live and openly criticize the players. Well, you are watching that game with no extra stress and no invested interest of trying to find the best move. A best move can actually give you a high standing in the prog event and one simple mistake can throw it all away.
So there is this extra stressors worrying you. And second of all, the only computer you can rely is your own little head and brain. So you've got to be a five head playing the position. You can't rely on anything else. And it's much more difficult as it seems and you'll see in this game. So here, Wojtaszek plays the logical, quote unquote, move, the king h8 move. You want to move away from white's pieces. But it turns out to be that king f8, the most illogical move you can think about is the better one. And after queen takes h6, the outstanding move of king e7 is something that black should play. Is by all means not something a human can do, openly running into the attack and just saying, well, I do not see the refutation. What is wrong with this? This just must be completely fine for me. And that is what humans can often not do because it physically and visibly just seems way too dangerous. So instead, Wojtaszek comes up with king h8, which is more logical, but on the other hand, less accurate. And these are those little mistakes that makes chess so interesting. Like it seems that um, it's all solved, but a little mistake can change the rhythm of the game. So now white decides to take on h6, but he could have also gone for d5. Of course, you cannot take this pawn because of rook e8 check. You've got to give up the queen, otherwise it's mate. So rook takes d5, rook takes e6, threatening again rook e8 and queen h6. So black has to go here, rook e8. And after rook f5, black is holding. But interestingly enough, there is this extra option of rook d1 check, knight e1, takes, takes. And most of us would consider this position to be better for black, but this is one of the exceptions. Actually, it is white who's better. And it has to do with the fact that this king on h8 is way too exposed and wants White manages to take the a6 pawn, White will have an easier time attacking the black king than black to organize the light pieces successfully. Those pieces are actually not coordinating well enough. So kind of the moral of the story with this one, if the light pieces don't coordinate well enough, white is better. Otherwise, it is black who's better because the two pieces are worth more. But in case it's two knights or they just don't cooperate well, it is clearly the advantage for the rook or rooks. Now, d5 wasn't played. Duda played queen takes h6 instead, queen h7. And of course, we get into a situation where Duda isn't going to go for trades. He is way more interested in the attack, rightfully so. There's barely anything covering that king apart from that lone queen. Queen f6, queen g7, queen takes e6. And just by a pure material count, you can tell that actually white is making big headways. He has three pawns for the piece, plus this king is ultra exposed on the h8 square, and it does not seem like it's going to survive the attack. And indeed, Wojtaszek cracks under pressure. Goes knight takes d4. But after knight takes d4, queen takes d4, white has the finishing touches. And after those finishing moves, black is just going to run out of defensive ideas and going to get checkmated. Here, white goes queen h6 check, king here, rook e8, and here Wojtaszek resigned because he saw after king f7, 
is queen e6 check, king g7, rook g8 check, king h7, and queen g6 checkmate. And it's very interesting to note that Duda barely was any better in this game, maybe worse once he went for that speculative but interesting bishop sacrifice. But after that sacrifice, he put Wojtaszek under so much pressure that he cracked and couldn't defend any longer. He did come up with one good defensive idea, but then he just crumbled and played the decisive mistake, knight takes d4. So this is the first game I wanted to show from Jan Krzysztof Duda. The second game I want to show was between Duda and the Tata Steel champion, Jordan van Forest. Let's take a look at that one. So this game is very interesting because you're wondering how Jordan van Forest's career is going to continue on. He came up with this spectacular result of tying for first in Tata Steel, then moving on to beat Anish Giri and claim the title. And here we see him sort of lean back on his preparation from that event. And we're going to see how Duda reacts to that one. c4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, bishop a4, knight f6, castles, knight takes e4. Now, this is sort of the modern way of playing. People like to go into open variations and then they add an extra little spicy twist. And that's exactly what Jordan van Forest is going to do in this game. However, compared to the previous time when he was relatively unknown and they didn't kind of expect anything spectacular from him, now he is a target so whatever interesting idea he springs, the opponents are prepared for them. d4, and the main main variation has been b5, bishop b3, d5 takes, and bishop e6. This has been popular for a long while by now, and especially prominently faced and played in the match between Karpov and Korchnoi, lots of times, and there was a legendary game played in 1995 between Garry Kasparov and Vichy Anand. Famously, knight d2, knight c5, c3, d4, and knight g5 happened, which nowadays is considered just a mainline move, but at that moment, this was a bombshell-like novelty. And even if you just look at it, it is just spectacular as it seems. White gives a knight away, seemingly for nothing, but there are plenty of tactical tricks looming, and Black does get into a bit of trouble if he does not know what is happening. And if you haven't checked it out yet, that is the Kasparov Anand game, which was won in a spectacular fashion by Garry Kasparov. But d4 bishop e7 is a variation and has been played previously by another Dutch player, Jeroen Piquet. You might not know him that much and that well if you're a younger player. But Jeroen Piquet was the strongest Dutch player for a while in the 90s and was considered a big prodigy of the time. He worked with none other than Viktor Korchnoi and he has essayed this idea of bishop e7, rook e1, and b5. So even though Jordan improved on this line, this has been played by Jeroen Piquet with some success. Rook takes c4, and the punchline is that black can go d5, double attacking 
the bishop and the rook. Knight takes c5, knight takes c5, rook takes c5. Of course, you has to, have to take on e5 because if you don't, then your knight is hanging and white is going to retain two pieces versus the rook. And compared to that previous example that I showed you to you guys, here white has more leeway for the pieces and white is just going to be much, much better. So knight takes e5, rook takes c5, b takes a4. And just from a stylistic perspective, this does feel a lot like a martial variation, but with a different move order and different tendencies. Now, this actually featured in the tiebreaker between Anish Giri and Jordan van Forest, but in that game, Jordan easily held Anish to a draw. But this time, Duda came prepared. Goes queen e2. So his first reaction is to make sure that he can put pressure on that bishop. He's just not letting Jordan castle so easily that would actually give up that bishop. Bishop e6. And now, sort of again, vintage Duda, he goes on for the most aggressive moves. F4. Again, saying you may not castle here, I'm going to go F5, you move the bishop, and I take yours on E7. And you're just in big trouble. So, Duda is sort of questioning this whole setup by Jordan and is trying to keep his king in the center. g6, still the best, defending that square, knight c3, attacking the a-pawn, a3. And this is actually a funny moment. What has the choice of either capturing the pawn or just pushing the b-pawn once and claiming that this a pawn is going to be more of a weakness than a strength. Now, regardless of which way or what way you'd continue here, if you take on a3, oftentimes those extra pawns would mean little to nothing as these pawns can't really advance too much and they don't really cover important squares either. So here Duda goes b3 instead, says, in the long run, that's going to be a weakness and I'd rather keep a healthy pawn structure anyways. Bishop b4, knight takes d5, castles. And this is very much heavy preparation by both of the players. You can't really take on b4 because of queen takes d4 check and Black is going to win some material. So instead, Duda centralizes. And that's actually the interesting part of chess. Even if you don't know theory, if you know the basic concepts, you barely can go wrong because most of your pieces will stand best in the center. And look at that. There is a big meeting going on in the middle of four squares, and it's all white as we can see. Bishop d6. However, queen e4 seems a bit illogical based on the fact that this rook is sort of running out of space. But then again, we come back to the dilemma of what is worth more. Does the rook worth more or a piece and a pawn? And it turns out it's not as trivial as we may think when we're just starting out chess, actually, you can get enough compensation for the rook if it's a piece and a pawn. So Duda does go knight c3. And here black goes bishop f5. But if bishop takes c5, white may go f takes c5. And because of all those dark square weaknesses and a weakened king side, 
black is probably worse over here. So knight c3, bishop f5. Still the best move. Still good stuff by both Duda and Jordan. But now we've got to decide. Should we stay or should we go? They just got to let us know. Should we stay or should we go? And of course, Duda always takes a challenge. So he takes on f5 and says, hey, your bishop on d6 isn't quite that good. It isn't really defending the king. So after this tra trades, the bishop isn't really a good defensive piece. And it ain't really a good attacker either because that pawn is well protected. On the other hand, white does have some nasty threats of bringing the knight to g5 and to f6 later on. So white's threats are very real, while black's pieces are somewhat scattered on the 8th. Rook e8, knight e4. Now that does not mean that white doesn't need to be precise. White absolutely need to be precise here, because black can go and get counter chances if white is not paying attention. Threats on d4, same threats on the king and on those pieces. So knight e4, setting up the idea of knight f6, knight g5. And black doesn't really have the luxury of sacrificing the rook back. White is up a pawn in that case. Bishop e7, bishop e3. Bishop e7 is a great move, by the way, by Jordan. He's trying to protect all those squares. And with those entry squares blocked off, it seems that he is close to get an even position. However, that turns out not to be the case. Actually is not the case. So interestingly enough, in this position, black has only one, one single way to survive the position. And Jordan either knew about it, that it exists, or he just did not know about it. Like maybe he didn't know about it, or he knew about it, but forgot the move. And that's actually part of the toughness of current day chess. You have, a ver you have to have a very good memory and a good feel for the game. And I wouldn't even blame anyone not finding this move if they hadn't looked at this previously. And the outstanding move is bishop h4 which looks very illogical. But the point is, not only does he want to put pressure on the knight and bishop with an eventual queen e7, but also wants to take away the g3 square from the knight. Now here the best move is rook f1. The line continues with queen c8. Knight f6 check, takes takes, rook takes, check, king here, f5. And black is up a whole rook, yet will have to be somewhat careful not to mess up the position. Rook e2, f6. Simple threat, queen g7, you can even go back and have d5. And the best move is to give up the rook, check, walk the king to d7, and after takes, rook takes c2, and believe it or not, black has enough play because 
the rook and queen is putting enough pressure and gives enough counterplay for the lost pawns. But these are those very strange moves you've got to make to be able to survive. Like these are not easy moves to find if you don't know what to expect. F1. And if queen e7, then there's rook f3. And if queen takes c4, there's queen g4 check. And black is under some pressure as this king on g8, that just moved to h8, is going to have to face attacks on the dark squares. But he played queen c8, whether he didn't know about it, he slipped, and now Duda is going to be clinical. Bishop h3, queen d3. Keeping the pieces on the board, he's saying the rook and bishop tandem is going to be stronger than your rooks. Takes, takes, queen e6, king f2. King f2 is again a stylish move. He knows it's going to be an endgame very soon, and if possible, I would love to have my rook go to h1. Queen e4, rook d1. Sure, we are re ready to trade, but it has to be on our terms. a5, g4, c6, takes, takes, g5. Again, making sure that there is no pawn pushes, and if this bishop can ever show up on f6 or e5, this king on g8 is going to be completely paralyzed, which is critical in the endgame phase. Rook e8, rook d3. h6 takes the pawn, f5. All right, so this is another critical point. White managed to stabilize. There's no way Jordan von Forest will be able to crash through. But, of course, young Krzysztof Duda wants to win. So the question is, how can white try to attempt that? Now, we're kind of stuck with our pieces. If we move the bishop, we would let that rook in the second rank. That wouldn't be ideal at all. If we would try to go g4, that would simply fail to f takes g4. And there's just too much pressure on that bishop. So just by the process of elimination, you've got to go for c4 and create a d-pass pawn. Rook e6, d5 takes, c takes d5, running the d pawn down, and that's also not a bad choice, because notice that, that square is actually the same square as our bishops, so takes, d6, rook d8, bishop c5, and here Duda is putting up a master class, that d6 pawn is well defended, and once this bishop gets a charger pawn and with an a eventual a3 b4 it's going to be invulnerable to any attacks by the rooks king f7 rook d5 again centralizing is the best thing you can do even in the end games king f6 bishop takes a3 rook h4 king f3 check rook takes a5 and slowly but surely Duda is picking up those pawns like berries. There's not much that black can do, and there is this eventual threat of getting that bishop to e5 via bishop b2, and then black will have no way of winning the d6 pawn ever. Rook f1, king e3, rook e8. So to Jordan's credit, he is trying to create some weaknesses in this position. Rook takes f4, bishop c5. Again, 
trying to charge that bishop over there. Once the charger pawn gets to b4, there is not much hope left in that case for black. Rook g4, check. King d6, check. King d7, rook takes f5, and now black is straight out of pawns. King takes d6, a4, rook takes g2. And even though um, Jordan managed to take the kingside pawns, these pawns are menacing enough. They're connected passers and they're also supported by the rook and bishop. So that is also bleak, as you'll see. Rook g4, check. Rook h5, just keeping that king out. Now, if there would be a check, that king would make a dash towards the queen side. So rook g8, king c3, check. Of course, as with the side who has just a rook and bishop, you're supposed to keep that rook just to keep variety. For black, obviously, one trade of the rooks would be more beneficial because there is another rook to compensate for the lack of the other one. Rook g6, rook h8, king d5, again, peace activity, check. Duda does not want any part of that. a5, rook h4, king b3, and now the king is walking away through the back door. Check. King b7, bishop d4, e6. Sacrifice, and you really don't have any ways to stop that. Check. King d5, bishop f6. The a pawn is running. You don't have any rook g7 moves. a7, and here black resigned. King d5 is more of the computer move showing that it was a game over because here Jordan decided to give up the fight. So I hope you very much enjoyed these games by Jan Krzysztof Duda and hope you learned how the Polish fighter plays his most aggressive chess. Thank you for watching.